Hello, I'm Dr. Dara Yubrzynski and you are watching What Wise Women Want here on Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. Every week we talk about topics that we hope are relevant to you. Ladies, we are 52% of the population with 85% of the purchasing power. We hope that you use this information we broadcast in order to make informed choices for yourself, your family, your community. You can find out about our programming on www.whatwisewomenwant.com and remember wise is spelled with a Z. There you'll find the women on our panels, upcoming and past programs, and the ability to connect or communicate with any, anyone who has been on our panels. Tonight our program is, I have to read it because it's so long, The Real Physiological and Mental Effects of Abortion. This is a topic that nobody wants to talk about. But as a therapist for many years, I have seen over and over and over again the physical and the psychological effects of women having abortions. And that's what we are going to cover today. No wives' tales, no fairy tales, the facts. And here are the women who work with this day in and day out. My panel is, to my right, Ruth Martha Scully, who's a post-abortion lay counselor. To her right is Kathy Brown, the executive director of the Pregnancy Center of Central Virginia. And to her right is Dr. Karen Pohalis, a family physician and the former medical director of the Pregnancy Center. Thank you ladies for talking about this subject that it's taken me an entire year to get people on to talk about mm -hmm. because nobody really wants to stick their neck out in terms mm -hmm. of this conversation. So let's start with, um, first of all, you know, I'm, uh, there are different kinds of abortions mm -hmm. and I'm not sure whether our audience realizes that there are, there's more than one mm -hmm. kind of abortion. Mm -hmm. So would any of you ladies like to sure. take that topic? Sure, the two most Mary? common types of abortion would be medical abortions, the so-called abortion pill, and surgical abortions. Medical abortions are the, are, they're called RU486 is one of the nicknames. The medication is mifepristone and the mother takes the pill which actually works to block the action of progesterone in her body. Progesterone is a hormone that's very important for the baby as it's developing. It's kind of like the um, supply source or the mothership that the progesterone helps to make sure that the mother and the baby are com communicating through the placenta. The RU486 or mifepristone blocks the progesterone in, that the mother is making from getting to where it needs to be for the baby. So it basically chokes off the baby's supply source. A second medication is then administered later called, um, mif called Cytotec or um, Mifepristone. And that medication actually serves to induce labor so that the mother would deliver the then dead baby. Okay. That's the medical abortions. They can only be done really up to 49 days after, into the pregnancy. Um, 49 days would be how? Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Mm -hmm. It can be done off-label, which means without FDA approval, some physicians will do it up to nine weeks or 63 days. Okay. Um, surgical abortions are in varying types depending on how far along the pregnancy is as well. The earliest stages of a pregnancy, it's what they call a DNC or dilation and curatage. And that basically is just serving to dilate the cervix, which is the opening to the uterus. and at the very earliest stages can be done by inserting a suction catheter and emptying out the contents of the uterus, which would be the placenta and the fetus. Um, when you get a little further on, that method alone won't work enough, so then you need to dilate the cervix and actually insert tools to break apart the contents of the uterus, the placenta and the fetus, and then they can be brought out either by suction or brought out directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I heard 
uh, a physician tell me, a couple of them tell me that they do something like um, seaweed uh, mm -hmm. implants or something? There are several ways to dilate the cervix. Okay. Um, the seaweed is one way to do it that takes a couple days. Um, mm -hmm. What it does is you insert, they're called laminaria, and they're inserted in through the cervix and they absorb moisture from the woman's body and slowly dilate and then dilate the cervix that way. Um, there, that's the natural way to do it is with the seaweed. There's also uh, apparently a way to do it with a artificial type of seaweed that again works to absorb water like a sponge and slowly dilate and as the sponge gets bigger it opens up the opens up the cervix. Okay, just mm -hmm. for the sake of our audience, um, because this is another thing that I've heard over the years, is there any kind of natural pill or herb that a woman can take in order to abort a child? Um, I've heard of it. Um, I don't, I would think there could be certain herbals you maybe could try to overdose on that may damage the baby enough to kill it. I don't know of one that would damage the baby enough to kill it and then induce the labor all in one step. Okay. All right. Just so not that I'm a, clear not that, that I'm aware. I mean, it's well. I know that the Native Americans do. That's why mm -hmm. that was the the I, I work with Native mm -hmm. Americans pro bono. So that was something that I was told by them. So mm -hmm. I wondered if that was an accurate. Mm -hmm. I would think herbs could kill the baby, but I can't think of a way that the same herb that would kill the fetus, or the baby, would actually be able to also induce labor and dilate the cervix and have the whole thing happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can see that our conversation here is going to be a bit of an intense because of the topic that we're talking about. So if you don't want to hear the kinds of things we're talking about, you know, I suggest you turn off this program. But we're going to get real here in terms of talking about this topic because I think it's, you know, young women have been, and many women have led, been led to believe. And by the way, we are not making any kind of religious claims here nor societal or anything else. Um, we're just trying to get the facts here and to, to be able to explain to you, especially young women who are contemplating, that you really need to think about this before you do this act, okay? Because there are many alternatives to abortion. You can give up children. There are many people who want to adopt. There are all kinds of other alternatives. and. We want you to be informed about abortion in order for you to know exactly what it is you're doing. Because let's go to that, for example, the, the mechanical abortion mm -hmm. part of it, okay? When the, um, you know, the suction tube is used and inserted into the uterus, mm -hmm. what kinds of things do you see um, as, do you see as ramifications uh, of that type of uh, methodology? If people are not using what's called twilight anesthesia, they will hear the noise, they will remember the sounds, they will remember the pain that they feel, and they may have nightmares, they may, um, they will definitely remember the date, if they, that's called anniversary syndrome, and they will remember the whole procedure. It's um, very traumatic, most women say that they cry. They tell us at the pregnancy center that they cry, they regret it, they wish they hadn't done it. And so the noise that you're talking about is the noise of the breaking apart or mm -hmm. you know the suction mm -hmm. machine or mm -hmm. of those kinds of things. They, and so they're not put out. You know, most women think that you're knocked out completely and that's not necessarily true. As a matter of fact, most cases, I don't think it's necessarily true, correct? They have to pay extra. I really don't know. I know they have to pay extra mm -hmm. for what's called twilight anesthesia, um, but that doesn't erase what you know is happening. And as soon as you mm -hmm. wake up, you know what's happened. Right, okay. And I also might add at the medical pill, I've read stories of women who have done the medical pill and they basically, after they take the second pill to induce labor, may have their abortion at home. Mm -hmm. So oh. that, yeah, so women can be going home and not really knowing what to expect, can have pretty wild cramping and will actually can sometimes see the embryo or fetus pass mm -hmm. into the commode. Um, that mm -hmm. is one of those things also I don't think you're going to ever forget very quickly and I'm not sure women are forewarned enough about how no, um, I didn't even know that one. how graphic mm -hmm. or difficult that can be the women with medical abortions 
often will complete the abortion at home. Mm -hmm. They're not going to complete it in the abortion Whoa. clinic. I had no idea. I mm -hmm. automatically assumed myself that this was done no. in the clinic. Okay. So we're going to work with Karen a little bit here mm -hmm. to, to establish a foundation here. Mm -hmm. So tell us what happens to a woman. What are the possible physiological mm -hmm. ramifications? Let's just focus on one thing right now with the suction and, mm -hmm. you know, breaking apart the fetus. Mm -hmm. What are what could possibly happen physiologically to the woman? Okay, as far to the as woman. to the woman, take it step by step. As right. far as dilating the cervix, you're forcing the cervix to dilate against its natural will as a muscle to stay closed, and it's supposed to stay closed to protect an early delivery. If you're forcing it open earlier than it should be, you run the risk of damage to the cervix itself. Um, they can, sometimes they can, a doctor can see that damage if they see a laceration or a cut, they can actually suture it to try to fix it. Sometimes it's what they call microfractures, where the cervix gets small tears that are too small to see, too small to be repaired. In subsequent pregnancies, that can lead to a cervix that is not going to be a strong enough muscle to hold the pregnancy in. So the woman, it's called an incompetent cervix, where the cervix often in the second trimester will just start dilating because the pressure of the growing baby inside the cervix has been damaged and wants to try to open on its own. That can so lead- premature? Premature or, or, miscarriage. or miscarriage. I mean, if it's before viability, mm -hmm. it may be an inevitable um, loss of the child because the baby will come out too soon to be able to survive. Or premature labor where sometimes they may need to try to put a suture into the cervix to try to hold it together to get the baby to a point far enough along to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like a tear? In a the tear, uterus. like a tear in the cervix actually. Cervix. Yeah, okay. in the cervix. Um, once you get past that step, when you talk about like if you're putting the suction or especially if you're having to put instruments into the uterus, that causes, you can get perforation or tear in the uterus from that. Right. Rates and studies that, for how often that can occur, range from 0.3% up to 3%. So if you wanna take an average of 1% of the time that that can happen, that there can be a cut in the uterus itself. Sometimes they can be small and inconsequential. Sometimes they can cause bleeding. If they're really severe, they could actually cause the need for an emergency hysterectomy. Mm -hmm in its wow. worst case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, sometimes, and, and a woman would not necessarily feel this or understand what was happening to her, because when you do have the abortion, you do bleed right afterwards, mm -hmm. so you would have absolutely no idea whether or not there's physiological damage there. Right, how much bleeding is normal, and right. people don't really have a paradigm to go off of for that, you know, if they're bleeding, how off, how many pads are you supposed to fill an hour or whatever to try to guess if you're home, whether this is a normal recovery or something wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so we've now talked about some of the physiological mm -hmm. kinds of repercussions. Are there physiological repercussions down the road? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what might they be? And, you know, Karen, if, if you want to uh, interject, I'm sorry, Kathy, if you want to interject you know, in this, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. feel free to, because, you know, I have a feeling, you know, we're, we're using Karen as the medical mm, expert absolutely. here, but I know that you, you know, if you've seen things as well, I mean, feel free to mm -hmm. interject. I will. Um, risks down the line. Um, and, and by the way, Ruth here is Ooh. our post-abortion. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to her in a minute. Go ahead, Karen. She has great stuff you need to get yes, to her. Yes. Um, as far We're just as, trying to set a right. set a framework so, here. Mm -hmm. um, risks, a lot of what, a more immediate concern looking at the first month or so out can be the risk of infection. Right. Um, it's estimated that about 25% of women undergoing abortion have an infection with um, an organism called chlamydia. And probably most of your listeners have heard about that. So chlamydia is a, is a direct effect of having had no, an abortion? No, no, no. Oh. But chlamydia is a sexually transmitted infection. So if you have women coming into an abortion clinic, about one in four will have an, a chlamydia infection when they walk through the door. A lot of chlamydia infections Whoa. women don't know about. Whoa. They have them, they don't have symptoms. If you do the culture or do the test, you find they have it. The problem with that is that if you have one in four women coming through the door who have chlamydia and may not know it, and to my understanding, clinics do not necessarily test women for 
this infection before they would have them undergo an abortion. Of the women who have chlamydia, about 25% of them can go on to develop PID, pelvic inflammatory Whoa. disease. Whoa. That's big. Um, it basically involves an infection that has come to involve the uterus, the fallopian tubes, which carry the egg into the uterus from the ovary. So if you get infection in there, it can A, be serious for the woman in the short term, pain, fever, hospitalization for antibiotics, but it can also cause scarring or damage to the fallopian tubes that may cause problems with the future pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So in other words, women who have had, let's say, um, uh, babies growing in the tube, which is called an ectopic a, pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy. I just want to make, I thought that was the name yeah. of it, but I just want to make sure we have the medical term mm -hmm. correct. So in other words, women who have had babies who are growing in the tube, a lot of times that is a um, manifestation of having had an abortion and gotten sometimes, sometimes say, and having gotten an, an infection. Mm -hmm. The rate of ectopic pregnancy um, with in a woman who has had a past abortion is three times higher than a woman who has never had an abortion. Mm -hmm. And probably due to the, I would think in a large case, due to infection or scarring damage from the abortion and from the infection af from an infection afterwards. Well, one of the things that mm -hmm. I wanted to really bring across to the audience is that in my experience, I've discovered that there is a parallel here in terms of having legalized abortion and infertility that has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, medical science does not make any references or talk about this topic in terms of having had abortions and the difficulty in ever becoming pregnant again mm -hmm. because they have had infections or all kinds of other issues, uh, ectopic pregnancies with that rupture where they no longer can ever sometimes mm -hmm. ever become mm -hmm. pregnant again, mm -hmm. uh, develop endometriosis and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, what was the, you said infection risks and um, uh, endome endometritis? Endometritis versus endometriosis, which was the term you used. And that's a real common thing that if um, people get confused, Endometriosis is probably present in about 10% of the population is where cells that are normally in the uterine lining, the endometrium, end up outside of the uterus, on the ovaries, elsewhere in the pelvis. Um, that is different from what would happen as a result of an abortion, which could be endometritis, which means literally an inflammation of the endometrium, usually from an infection. Okay. Untreated endometritis could be a cause of infertility in future pregnancies because it will scar the lining of the uterus, mm -hmm. um, or the uterus lining becomes so full of inflammatory cells, infection fighters, that it's not able to do its normal function to be the first place that the embryo rests to start developing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have had women in my practice who have had, for example, plastic prosthesis put in their fallopian tubes in order to open them because they've had these infections. Mm -hmm. Women who have had their um, cervix, correct me if I'm wrong, sewn because they couldn't hold the baby right. mm -hmm. and um, couldn't take babies to term, so they mm -hmm. had to stay in bed with their, you, you know, so, being sewn and then, you know, the stitches would come out uh, at the time of I mean, I've heard all kinds mm -hmm. of situations, mm -hmm. and these are the kinds of things that we want to bring to your attention because they are not spoken about um, in depth at all, mm -hmm. much less to young women who are going in to having an abortion. So again, we are not saying have it, don't have it, none of that. This is not a politically correct conversation. Mm -hmm. This is right. all about understanding the ramifications, what the mental and physical ramifications of this. Mm -hmm. I think when we were talking about, um, you know, when I thought about reflected on the topic of your show, what wise women want, as a physician, most women who come into my office for whatever reason want to know when I'm proposing a treatment, what are the, what are the risks, what are the benefits, and they weigh them. So my hope was what, when we were doing, preparing this, what I'm bringing to the table to help your listeners is, you know, 
to be able to give them that informed decision. I don't know any patients who come into me for other treatments who say, you know, don't tell me what the side effects are, I don't wanna know. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hoping we can bring out here in a, you know, off of studies, non-judgmental, just this is right. what can happen. And the reason I'm bringing up the topic is because I have seen so many women over the years, um, both at young women as well as older women mm -hmm. who have developed cancer and other things because of their abortions or who have had infertility problems or things of that nature. And the first question out of my mouth is, have you had an abortion? How many have you had? And you know, nine times, I mean, I have heard three, four, five abortions mm -hmm. and here they are having, now we've talked about mm -hmm. physical. So Kathy, let's go to the emotional realm now. Um, Give us a little bit of information about what it is that you see, um, but, well, actually both of you, mm -hmm. in terms of the emotional, the, the ramifications in the emotional realm. Be, as they're deciding whether to have an abortion? All of the above. When, um, when women are you faced- You have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> when women are faced with the decision to abort, it's usually very fast, very pressured, very fear-driven. And one of the things that they need to do is stop and think about everything, do their research, evaluate what's their goals, how will they feel not only in two weeks after the procedure, but how will they feel five years down the road? What will be the right thing? And one of the ways to help your listeners understand that is, think of a tornado. A tornado is very, very quick, it comes in, you may have initial relief when the storm is over. It's passed, it's done, my house is standing. But then you need the internal damage. What has happened inside? Is the foundation still sound? You are never the same after a tornado. You are never the same after an abortion. Um, it changes you, um, it changes you dramatically. And women just need to understand there's always options there's always choices yes it's it's not the plan that you were maybe thinking of when you started school started your career even in high school but you can still make choices don't let fear run run the choice that you're going to make i wonder if choice you know women think that this is a choice and really, I mean, we've, we've taken it to the level of being so politically correct mm -hmm. that it's almost like it's not even a choice anymore. It's the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, am I correct? I mean, I see teenagers all the time mm -hmm. making this decision mm -hmm. without ever looking into it, without ever, they just, oh, I'm pregnant, I'm going mm -hmm. to get an abortion. I mean, there's no thought processes whatsoever behind that. What kinds of, and both of you, you know, see this afterwards, mm -hmm. what kinds of, let's say, mental, emotional um, states do women or situations that do you see? Mm -hmm. um, it's such a huge decision and women are going to have some effect from it no matter what. I'd like to first talk about a couple of studies that I looked at and um, one of them was done very interestingly by Professor David Fergus Ferguson from New Zealand who is pro-choice. But he did this and found that at age 25, we're talking about younger women, 42% of the women in the study group who'd had an abortion, experienced major depression over the four years. Um, this was nearly double the rate of those who'd never been pregnant and 35% higher than those who um, chose to continue the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, the researchers, and I will quote them, say, those having an abortion had elevated rates of subsequent mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, suicidal behaviors, mm -hmm. and substance use disorders. And those are just a few of them. Um, this was the largest study of its kind internationally. And then another one out of the DC area um, quoted a couple of studies that approximately 52% of early abortion, in other words, an early abortion, which is what most women have, 67% of a late-term abortion group met the American Psychological Association's criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, which we call PTSD. 
And uh, another study out of Canada found that uh, women who'd had abortions are four more times likely than women who haven't to abuse drugs and alcohol. And that is absolutely huge. I have seen that so much with the women that I've met with over the years. Mm -hmm. um, he mentioned so why, why do you think, why, do, why are women getting depressed and going to alcohol and drug mm -hmm. abuse? What is it that is the catalyst? You know, why are they doing this? I think when a woman becomes pregnant, she becomes a mother. Whether she realizes it or not, her body knows it. Her nurturing instinct knows that she's a mother. So having an abortion is absolutely the most unnatural thing to do. Pregnancy is natural. Giving okay. birth is a natural thing for women. Mm -hmm. We were pretty much mm -hmm. built for it, you know. And um, so when she has that abortion, it affects her entire being. Mm -hmm. It affects her self-esteem greatly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never met a woman who didn't say that she suffered from lower self-worth, self-esteem mm -hmm. after her abortion. And that's because she feels like she's done pretty much the worst thing she could do by taking the life of her unborn child, um, regardless of the circumstances. And these are not some of the topics that we really talk about, mm -hmm. you know, the after yeah. effects of abortion. Yeah. We really, I mean, those of us who are in the mental health, mm -hmm. we see it all the time, but really there's nothing really. And women go around depressed and, you know, mm -hmm. actually suicidal, I've seen as well, mm -hmm. yeah. and don't even understand why they are feeling the way they are feeling. And so, you know, because we're not open about this conversation and talking about the ramifications, mm -hmm we aren't giving women the information that they need mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to be able to understand what's happening to them physiologically, mm -hmm. mentally, mm -hmm. sp emotionally, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really, really important. And, you know, this goes to the secret. Uh, I was doing a um, um, workshop in Virginia Beach and uh, this young lady of 18 came to the workshop. It was an all-female. There were 50 women in the group. And she came and said, could I participate? I had met, met her at lunch earlier that day. And I said, certainly, you're welcome to come. Um, and she sat down and with the rest of the group. And we were working through all kinds of women's issues. And we, it was about 11 o'clock. And I said, turn to her before all the women had left. And I said, did you get what you came for? And she said, no. And I said, why not? And she said, because I'm trying to decide if I should have an abortion tomorrow. Mm -hmm. At which point, all of the women mm -hmm. in the group stopped. Mm -hmm. There were 50 of them. Mm -hmm. And they all came, and every single one of them had had an abortion and never talked about it, never verbalized it, had never told anyone. We were up till three o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. all of them talking about, you know, this is what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were gray haired la ladies there and 20 year olds. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. she got an, an understanding of mm -hmm. um, what it's like. She heard all about it. She met with us for a few days afterwards, ended up having one anyway. Mm -hmm. and ended up ended in a mental institution a year later. Mm -hmm. So I understand this because I have seen it over and over mm -hmm. again. And, you know, we don't talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that 50 women in that group had never, ever, ever mm -hmm. told anybody is mm -hmm. incredible to me. It's a mm -hmm. big secret. Exactly. It's yeah. a huge secret. And even if women have said, I've had an abortion, they really never talk about mm -hmm. what happened to them afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, Kathy, can you give us some more um, information about the kinds of, you know, what, what, what comes to you? I mean, what, ha what are the kinds of things that come to you? Well, I think we need to look at how many abortions are happening. Okay. Um, one at a statewide. One out, of six win, one, one out of six pregnancies ends in abortion. Locally here in Charlottesville, 31%, almost one out of three pregnancies in the city of Charlottesville on residence ends in abortion. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot of people. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, for 2012, there was 21,438 abortions in the state of Virginia. Locally, there was 1,054 
at the local abortion facilities. How do we know these numbers? These all come from the Virginia Department of Health okay. statistical tables. It's published mm -hmm. every year. Okay. And it's something we really look at to see the trends. Right. Um, everyone assumes it's teens having abortions, and it's not. It used to be 80% of the abortions were 24 and younger. Now teens only account for 10% really? of all abortions. Mm -hmm. Most of them are 18 and 19 years old of the 10% of teens. 58% of abortions are, are sought by women in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge number. That would be, uh, when I was growing up, that was the age when many of my friends and, and college roommates got pregnant and had their first baby. Um, and 58% of the abortions are for women in that age group. The second highest age group are women in their 30s, and that's 27% of all the abortions are for women in their 30s, and 4% are 40 and older. Is there any statistical mm -hmm. data on why that uh, it occurs, that women in these older ages are having abortions? I think it. you have to look at all the reasons why women abort. It's anxiety, it's relationship issues, it's finances, it's not the right time, it's inconvenient right now, I can have them later, um, my career comes first, I'm in college. Um, all different reasons uh, of why women would see that as their primary motivator, rather than thinking this is a change in my plans, but it's my first child. And that's something that is not talked about. This is your first child, and everyone who's had children remembers that feeling, whether you're scared, and, and most of us are scared the first <laughs> nine months. That's why we have nine months, to get ready for it. And you have to look at, where do I want to be in five years? Do mm -hmm. I want that child? We had um, a teenager speak at, one of our events, and she said, I am a teen mom, I am in high school, I will graduate this year, I will make it, I am determined to make it. And she had her little nine-month-old baby with her, mm -hmm. and she, she will make it, I know she will make it. And we, it's important that other women come around them and support them and encourage mm -hmm. them. It's a hopeful thing to have a baby, and I think that's part of why the depression kicks in. That's, to me, when you choose abortion, you don't have hope, you don't have resources, you feel scared, and... Well, there's also the other uh, comment that's, you know, political, which is if they don't have abortions, we're gonna have more on the welfare rolls and more kids, you know, getting food stamps and, and that kind of thing. So, because many of the people who are on that kind of income are women mm -hmm. who have had, especially teen mothers who have mm -hmm. opted to keep their children mm -hmm. for whatever mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. instead of having an abortion. So there's all kinds of, you know, uh, topics that go on back and forth. Right now you're listening to What Wise Women Want. I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski. You're watching Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. Our panel today is talking about the real physiological mental effects of abortion. And they are, to my right, uh, Ruth Martha Scully, who's a post-abortion lay counselor. To her right is Kathy Brown, Executive Director of the Pregnancy Center. And to her right is Dr. Karen Pohalis, who is a family physician and the former director of the Pregnancy Center. Now, let's go back to um, do you have any uh, uh, statistics or information on, I said earlier about the parallels between the, you know, the legality of women getting abortion mm -hmm. and the infertility. Do, mm -hmm. Does anybody have any data on sterility with regards to abortion? Um, there are two studies I can find on that. Um, they were both from Greece showed a two to three times increased risk in subfertility, meaning lowered fertility in women who were post-abortive. Um, other studies didn't really show an increased risk. Some of the things we've talked about could certainly come into effect as causing um, infertility, the uterine infections that I had mentioned. 
or um, if a woman has scarring in her fallopian tubes. Ectopic pregnancy is one outcome. Another outcome can be that the tube is so scarred that the egg and the sperm never manage to meet and she can never even achieve a pregnancy to start with. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of leads to an interesting point. If you notice, um, for a lot of the medical studies, I'm quoting Greece. If you look at breast cancer risks, you look at studies from China and other places. Um, it's fascinating or a little bit sad that these that there are no really good studies being done in the United States. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't really find good medical studies in the United States on these issues. Most of the analyses are drawn off of data from overseas. Um, they're helpful. I'm glad they're there, but I would like to see some more interest in the United States among the academic medical institutions, or mm -hmm. even if you know among abortion providers, if they feel that it is so safe, let's get the numbers out there. And you just can't find them. Mm -hmm. And you would, you know, mm -hmm. we we all know those reasons. How about because obviously, you know, we all see the the after effects, mm -hmm. and so. They're not about to talk about it politically or otherwise. Mm -hmm. How about multiple abortions? I mean, I said earlier that mm -hmm. some women have two, three, four, mm -hmm. five. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you, do you have any information on that? Guttmacher says that 45% of abortions are repeat abortions. Mm -hmm. And that, that's about the only statistic that I could find on it. Did mm -hmm. you find anything, Karen? No, as far as like risks increasing with numbers, repeat numbers of abortions, um, I could find information on ectopic pregnancy rate increasing. That's the tubal pregnancy rate increasing with multiple numbers of abortions. Other complications were thought to possibly go higher with it, and it would make sense that they would, but the data couldn't, there weren't enough numbers to get the data to come out statistically significant. Okay. So what, let's talk, well, we really haven't, you know, delved into the, the mental Mm -hmm. and, and psychological ramifications. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us some stories or you know, something that you found in your clinics or your groups um, in order to help some women understand things that are, women are going through? A couple of years ago, a lady came mm -hmm. into our center um, whose sister brought her in. Her sister had gone through the study that I do, the support group, with me and knew her sister needed to do it. Her sister had been hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital up in New Jersey and mm -hmm. was came out of it unchanged. She simply wasn't coping. She was so depressed and mm -hmm. so mentally unstable that she wasn't even eating properly. So her sister that we already knew at the center brought her to Charlottesville and started taking mm -hmm. care of her. Mm -hmm. One day, finally, um, the ill sister mentioned, well, there was this abortion in my past, and finally the, the sister who had already healed from hers was able to tell her to go to the center and get some help, and get involved in this post-abortion uh, support group, and she did that. And she, we both have met with mm -hmm. um, this woman, and um, she, she became a new person. She, I actually talked to her earlier this evening and she mm -hmm. is doing very well, very healthy. And she had a lot of other traumatic events in her life, so they kept thinking it was that. Uh. They tried many medications and nothing was working. When she finally dealt with her abortion, she was able to put it where it belongs in her past, accept it, mm -hmm. resolve it in her mind and in her emotions and become healthy again. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of other stories. Um, women do all kinds of things after their abortions. Mm -hmm. They, you know, the eating disorders we mentioned. One woman in my group um, stopped dressing nicely. She stopped shopping, mm -hmm. and she realized towards the end of the, the time that we were together that she hadn't gone shopping, and she had stopped wearing makeup ever since her abortion mm -hmm. because she didn't feel worthy of looking nice. She mm -hmm. didn't want to look attractive anymore. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And once she got through it and resolved it again, as I say, and received some healing from the abortion, she was able to say, I'm going to go shopping. I'm going to start wearing makeup again and, and feeling mm -hmm. good about myself. It's amazing what abortion does to a woman's self-worth. Why, why does it hurt so deeply? I think for each woman it would be different. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that it... It, it cuts at a deep place in your heart. Mm -hmm. There's usually disappointment. You're let down possibly by your boyfriend, by your mm -hmm. husband, by your parents. Then you're told not to talk about it. 
you're not you're not encouraged to talk about it and so it goes deeper and deeper and the initial relief you fel felt after the abortion becomes denial and then it can become depression and then you don't feel worthy and there can be a lot of sexual disturbances a lot of risky behavior can ensue um, whether it be alcohol drugs uh, porno uh, pornography addiction promiscuity is there is huge mm -hmm. um, and then we see the the woman who is she wants a replacement baby mm -hmm. because they are so concerned about their fertility that they will get pregnant again with two or three months mm -hmm. afterwards and then have that baby um, and it we call it a replacement baby mm -hmm. okay they've suffered a loss yes whether they yeah, the things that you were not. saying sound mm -hmm. like grieving, you know, grieving, steps absolutely. in grieving. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. They're not allowed to grieve, and that's one thing that the, the center is very mm -hmm. good at, is providing the love and the support that they really need, because how do we heal from grieving? It's the love of other people around us. Love will heal mm -hmm. um, most everything in our lives. And the love of yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So what is, the, what is the generational impact of abortion on families? Um, how does that work? What does that look like? It affects the mother who has the abortion. It affects the boyfriend. Bo men and, and boys who are part of an abortion experience have much higher suicide rates. Mm. They have a lot of alcohol and drug issues. And it's something that they carry. They feel unworthy as a father. And issues oftentimes come up when they become a father. They will have flashbacks um, and think, will, will I do it right? Can mm -hmm. I do this? Mm -hmm. Will my child be sick as punishment of some, you know, our mind goes in all different directions. It definitely affects the grandparents when mm -hmm. they find out um, whether they take their daughter for the abortion. That's their first grandchild. And there is an impact on, it may not be their first mm -hmm. grandchild, but it's the first grandchild from this daughter. And it definitely will affect them. And even the siblings mm -hmm. of the mother can be affected. Um, there's someone missing in the family. When you think one out of six is missing, there's someone missing um, in, in, in every family almost that is touched by abortion. So it has, go ahead. Yeah. You were well, I was going to say, having had an abortion myself um, over 40 years ago. and So you can speak to this. Yes, mm -hmm. I can speak and I understand what these w women are feeling, mm -hmm. which is why I do the support groups. But the, there came a time when I had to tell each of my children mm -hmm. that I'd had an abortion for different reasons. I was so involved with the center and people were, were knowing my story. And so I had to tell them <laughs> before somebody else would tell them. In fact, that almost happened. And that was a really hard thing for me to do is to tell them that I had aborted their sibling. Um, mm -hmm. They all took it in slightly different ways. One was absolutely aghast. It's like, how could you do that, Mom? You know? Another one just sat there and the tears came down her face. And I did it on four different occasions because I have four living daughters. And um, it's hard when you think about it. Mm -hmm. What well, I your, regret If that. you don't mind, what was your experience mm -hmm. that you can convey that brought um, you to this point? You mean to have the abortion or after? Uh, no, having had having the abortion. Had. I mean, yeah. were you a teenager? No, or? I wasn't at all. As a matter of fact, I was married. You were married? But I was very unhappily married, and I was determined. It was actually my second pregnancy, so I already had a child, and I was determined to end that marriage. Um, it was wrong from the beginning, <clears throat> that whole relationship. And so I was afraid that if I had another child with him, that um, I would be stuck with him. For so the rest was, of your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was very bad timing getting pregnant then, and I was angry and frustrated because I had a great career, I didn't want to give up, and I was very unhappily married and did not want to stay with it. So um, I walked into that abortion clinic and I was absolutely convinced I was gonna walk out of there and forget it, put it behind me, and never think about it again. And what happened? Doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. So what happened to you? Um, it took a long time. I, I guess I, I don't know if I denied it or repressed it, but one of those things, and I was extremely relieved that I was no longer pregnant. But about 15 years down the road, when I had actually met 
my husband I'm married to now and had more children, I saw a video that showed an aborted child at the stage that I had aborted my child. And uh, it was pretty shocking. Mm -hmm. And I started crying and I couldn't stop crying. Mm -hmm. So the regret was huge. And I thought, why did I do that? I could have had that baby, you know? I could have taken care of that child, regardless of what would have happened after. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I brought to it. I didn't suffer terrible depression. I, I never was suicidal, but intense grief mm -hmm. and regret, wishing I had never done it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a lot of times women don't realize that, you know, as you spoke about mm -hmm. earlier, um, sometimes the pregnancy is so far along, the suction mm -hmm. isn't enough, and so they have to get in there and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. break the body apart. And I'm sorry we're being mm -hmm. so graphic, but that's the truth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and they'll go in there and cut, you know, mm -hmm cut here, there, and everywhere, yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, in order to be able to um, have the have the baby pass. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that correct? Right. They yes. have to be able to basically get the um, embryo down to a small enough size to be able to pass out through however large they're able to dilate the cervix. Okay. Because of the risk of the damage to the cervix, you want to try to get by with dilating it as little as you can. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you have a, you know, 13 or 14 week baby in there, you've got to basically try to get it smaller if you're, if you're not going to like force the woman to dilate up, up larger, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what are women's alternatives to abortion? I mean, you know, these young women feel like this is the only mm -hmm. solution. Um, what are women's, what are the alternatives? Obviously, it's having the baby, whether mm -hmm. you're a teenager or however mm -hmm. old you are. What are the what are there any other kinds of options for women? Women can always c c choose adoption. Adoption. We just had an adoption uh, last week, um, and it was beautiful. Um, it was. It's going to be hard on the mom, but she came to our center and said, "I know I cannot take care of my child, and I want this baby to have the best chance at life that it can have." And she. This mom had the biggest smile, and I hope that her child has that big smile and big heart. And um, our counselor met the adoptive family. She worked with a, a charity that places babies for adoption, and she picked out the family, and she will stay in touch with that family, and it's it will bless both of them. Okay, so, so in other words, if a, if a woman chooses not to have an abortion, she can have the option of giving it up for adoption and or following that child or, you know, not following mm -hmm. it if she chooses. There's all mm -hmm. types of kinds of adoptions. Mm -hmm. You know, one is that you just, you know, give the child up for adoption and let it go completely. Mm -hmm. Or you can have, a, you know, participate in that child's life or you know, not participate and yet know the family that mm -hmm. are adopting. Is that correct? Are those most adoptions are are open adoptions now? What does mm -hmm. that mean? And that means that the mother would, the birth mom would stay in touch with the family that is raising the child, and the child would know that it has a, a, a home mom and a birth mom. Mm -hmm. So, what are what are statistics on? I mean, what are the the you know it. Uh, on the children who, and I just, I didn't, didn't even think about this as a, now that you say it, but what is the, uh, what happens to the child who realizes that the mother has given them up for adoption and is in another family who has adopted them? I mean, is that a good situation for a child? The child, it, it depends how it's presented to the mm -hmm. child and how old they are when they find out. I. I think it's the adoption agencies recommend that you tell the child as early as possible. We took a picture of the mom when she was nine months pregnant about to deliver so that she could give it to the birth parent, the adoptive parents, and say, your mom loved you so much, she wanted you to have a great life. And she wasn't able to provide it, but she loved you. And that's the key, is that the child right. know that they're loved. Right. Mm -hmm. and that they are safe. Children need to know that they are safe. So as long as the adoptive parents can provide that and say, mommy loved you enough to give you to us to raise. Okay. 
That's good. One of the, one of the you know, the things that you, I mean, it's just in the back of my mm -hmm. mind here are those statistics that you told us about with regards to the old, I mean, everybody kinds of thinks of abortions as teenagers who, mm -hmm. you know, have had unplanned pregnancies. But what you're really telling us is that these are ages of women who really should know better in their 20s and 30s and, mm -hmm. you know, who have the option of taking, you know, prescriptions and, mm -hmm. and using all kinds. I mean, there's so many accesses to why is it women get pregnant? These older women are getting, I mean, I know 20 doesn't sound old to some people, but, mm -hmm. you know, why is it women who are mature, let's put it that way, um, aren't using, you know, contraceptives? Why, what is the, what is the... Do you think that society is not teaching people that there are benefits and consequences for every choice? Everything cannot just be erased. Right. Um, and everybody in their 20s and 30s should know that they have to take responsibility. But when abortion is legal, it seems like the easier way mm -hmm. out. And okay. I think that's why you also have repeat abortions because it's used as a form of birth control by some women in our country without realizing the implications. There was just in the news last week a 16-year-old in England who already had had four abortions mm -hmm. and it was all over the news in England because what are we teaching our, mm -hmm. our teens? What are we what are the mm -hmm. medical implications mm -hmm. of that? What are the mental health implications mm -hmm. of, of that choice? Well, as mm. a therapist who works with teens and young adults, I can honestly say, I mean, I've been in practice for 30 years, 30 plus years, and I can say that the amount of youths coming to me constantly now is escalating with regards mm. to the lack of consequences of mm -hmm. their behaviors. Mm -hmm. They're either being bailed out, mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, getting even con contests and things like that. Everybody gets an award, mm -hmm. nobody loses. I mean, there's no consequences from mm -hmm. every direction. Mm -hmm. And I see this over and over again with mm -hmm. use that I, they go, they graduate from high school, let's say, and they go out in the job world, for example. And they don't understand the consequences of the choices that they're making mm -hmm. on the job and get mm -hmm. fired and fired and fired over and over again and are wondering why. Because, you know, in all those days when they were growing up, mm -hmm. nobody ever sat down with them and said, if you do this, this is the consequence. Right. Or get going to jail for shoplifting, you know. Wow. Or, I mean, I have right now teens in my practice who have... Normally, shoplifting is a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. and they have been charged with felonies because of the amount of mm -hmm. things that they stole. Mm -hmm. A felony is forever. Mm -hmm. When you are under 16, it is forever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think this has a lot to do with this, and, you know, parents as friends rather than parenting, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all these kinds of things, you know, we, it seems like we got a little bit off the topic, but I really am not because what I'm trying to say is that, you know, helping your children understand the consequences and the choices that they are making mm -hmm. is something that is a life for life. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to parent them, if you're not going to direct them, guide, you are not their friend. Mm -hmm. You are their parent. You are there to protect mm -hmm. them and keep them safe and secure. And many times, I mean, like the girl in Virginia Beach, she was, you know, of age 18 and did not tell her parents mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, now is, you know, completely incapacitated mm -hmm. in terms of living a life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if you have a scare of a pregnancy and you have a negative test or a positive test, but talk to people, talk mm. to your parents, trust your parents, they want what's best for you. But think about what are your life goals? What is, this, is this behavior helping me or harming me? Mm -hmm. Am I making the right boundaries, personal boundaries, that I need in my life to achieve my goals? Mm -hmm. are, am I setting goals that, that I should be setting? And personal boundaries, again, are another issue. I see 
teens constantly who come to me because at 12, 13, and 14, they put a naked picture, mm -hmm. you know, sent it as a text 16. message, mm -hmm. and then went everywhere. And, you know, for a small town like this, it mm -hmm. goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. exactly. And they're gone from school to school to school, and there's nowhere mm -hmm. they can go that somebody oh, hasn't seen see. this and mm -hmm. knows who they are. So, you know, these boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, again, that also has to do with the sexuality. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have so many things that in our culture today that we are not teaching our children. Mm -hmm. And the boundary, the discrimination, the discernment, all these mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. the choices are part of why this has become mm -hmm. the answer to or the solution mm -hmm. right. for, um, you know, becoming pregnant at earlier ages. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're in our last few minutes here. Is there anything that I haven't covered or we haven't covered that you'd like to, you know, perhaps bring into the conversation in, in just the next few minutes that we have? Um, that perhaps we didn't, um, you'd like to talk about? I think it's important. <laughs> I think it's important that what Ruth does, that women know that there is help available, mm -hmm. that they don't have to remain silent, and they yes. should not be silenced. Mm -hmm. Let's validate the feelings of guilt and whatever they are feeling. The anger, intense anger, is very common. Yeah. Um, One of the things we do at the end of the support group time, which usually takes eight or nine weeks, is the women name their babies, which, like you said, it validates the fact that that child was real. And um, you know, our society doesn't exactly. have a place for that. We don't bury our unborn children because we've aborted or them, or our miscarriages. Either. Yeah, even mm -hmm. our miscarriages, right. exactly. But when they name them, and then they usually do something to commemorate that child, um, write a poem, plant a tree different things like that. And that helps them with the whole grieving process. It mm -hmm. helps them resolve what they did and come to terms with it mm -hmm. and put it where it belongs in the past. But something they'll probably always wish they hadn't done. Right. But they mm -hmm. can live with it then at least. Right. Mm -hmm. Learn exactly. to accept it. Mm -hmm. Karen, have we covered all the physiological? Um, one that might deserve a brief mention I alluded to was breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, because that one hits the press a fair amount. Um, and Breast cancer, there have been, again, like looking at foreign studies, but two major meta-analyses that basically showed that the risk for a woman who has a pregnancy um, that terminated, has an abortion before her first term pregnancy, has between a one-third to 40% higher risk of breast cancer than someone who had carried that pregnancy to term. Well, I'd like to thank you ladies for being on the show tonight. Again, we have Ruth, Martha Scully, Karen, Br Kathy Brown, and Karen, Paula Halis, and you have been watching What Wise Women Want. I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski here on Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. You can see anything you'd like about our programming today or the people contacting them or our future programs on www.whatwisewomenwant.com. Remember, wise is spelled with a Z. That's www.whatwisewomenwant.com. Please join us again, and I hope you were duly informed about what it is that we wanted to talk to you about today. And I apologize for the heavy content, but I think it's a topic that really needs to be discussed, mm -hmm. and we need to start talking about it in our communities and to our teenage, especially to our teenage girls and boys. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a wonderful time. We hope to see you back again next week. Thank you.